My name is Ross Mandeville. I am co-director at the UCSD Paralysis Center and the lead author for a neurophysiological approach to nerve transfer to restore upper limb function in cervical spinal cord injury. In this video, we hope to highlight a few key concepts. What actually is nerve transfer surgery? Why might neurophysiology be useful? And what particular studies might help most in planning the surgery? So the basic goal of nerve transfer is to redistribute redundant, cortically, consciously controlled nerves with the aim of reanimating paralyzed muscle groups, predominantly those which are critical to reaching and grasping in the case of cervical spinal cord injury patients. In this image on the right side, we see the functionally redundant but cortically well-controlled brachioradialis axons being transferred, donated, to the preserved neural tubes of the anterior interosseous nerve, aiming to restore finger and thumb flexion. Compare this to the tendon transfer using brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus on the left side of the image. This image shows three segments, a supralesional segment where the patient retains normal control of the associated lower motor neurons, potential donors, a middle segment we call the injured metamere. This is where there has been gray and white matter disruption with interruption of descending signals, as well as loss of the cell bodies of the peripheral motor nerves. The third segment is the infralesional segment. This region generally retains the integrity of its lower motor neurons, but is disconnected from corticoid control, potential recipients. Importantly, there is not a clean transition between these regions. For an effective reconstructive plan, we need to recognize which of these three conditions affects the muscles of interest, i.e. how much upper or lower motor neuron damage has occurred in the donor and recipient nerves. We can see there is a high chance of significant lower motor neuron injury in muscles innervated by that border zone between the suprasional segment and the injured metamere. Thus, it is very important to quantify the quality and quantity of motor axons in the potential donor nerve. Assessment of these donor nerves relies on analysis of the interference pattern. This is the EMG signal at maximum effort comprising all voluntary motor units. If this is more than moderately reduced in our institution, we routinely use motor unit count. This technique, the motor unit count, involves visually counting the individual motor units in the interference pattern. We do this several times within the muscle or muscles innervated by that donor nerve, and then use the average motor unit count to categorize how good a donor nerve it would be. Here we see a normal interference pattern. Note that it is impossible to count individual motor units. This would be an excellent donor nerve. This interference pattern shows a single motor unit firing. This would be classified as a very poor donor. And this interference pattern is categorized as a questionable donor. There are three motor units firing. This would likely only be used as a donor if no other options were available and the entire nerve could be harvested. There are several additional quantitative techniques beyond that of the motor unit count, which are applied on occasion. One such approach involves further decomposing the interference pattern. The average product of the firing rate and motor unit size can be used to create an index of innovation or innovation quotient. This is useful when the motor unit count is unclear or more precision is needed. It can also inform on upper motor neuron involvement to some degree. Another technique that can be applied is that of motor unit number estimation. These methods aim to quantify the number of motor units within the muscle being examined using surface or needle electrodes. This technique is very appealing in that it attempts to get to the core question directly, how many motor units are in the entire muscle. It is again important to confirm the quantity of motor axons in these recipient nerves. If too affected by lower motor neuron loss, then we would not expect a great outcome in terms of strength if we were to transfer into that nerve. We first stimulate the nerve, observing the movement generated by the single or multiple stimuli. At the same time as observing this movement, we obtain a compound motor action potential using either a surface or needle electrode. We can even select nerve branches using ultrasound guidance. Here we can see the tip of the needle approaching the posterior interosseous nerve. Further quantification can again be acquired through the technique of motor unit number estimation. Here we see a particular type of motor unit number estimation, the CMAP scan. This involves a program that incrementally increases the stimulus and records the compound motor action potential, producing a nice visual representation of all the motor units in the muscle. 
The evaluation of the donor, recipient, and indeed backup agonist nerves is an important part of preparing for nerve transfer surgery in spinal cord injury. The combined clinic, where there is a dynamic interplay between the neurophysiologist and reconstructive neurosurgeon is ideal. The use of a more quantitative neurophysiological approach helps guide surgical planning and likely improves outcome. There is still much interesting research to optimize the neurophysiological approach to nerve transfer surgery in spinal cord injury, but the techniques ultimately developed can immediately be applied in this clinic as well as the research setting.